25 years of fearless and independent journalism. Hello and thank you for joining us from wherever you are. We are live from our studios here in Kokomlemle. Digital address GA0992539. Let me take you through our top stories this hour. Ghana's COVID-19 cases rise to 195 as one of the regions without cases records it first. With details from government press conference and from that region, as President Akufado's physician also revealed he and his household tested negative to coronavirus. We also have updates from around the world, as usual. And we take you onto the front line today. You'll hear a passionate appeal from doctors begging you to stay at home to stop the spread. A passionate soldier urging Trotro passengers to observe social distancing. And a doctor will be in studio to answer your questions. Also, how are you adhering to the lockdown yourself at home? We have been on our usual checks in town and we'll tell you how typically crowded areas are observing social distancing and using sanitizers and how the security agencies are enforcing the lockdown. Join us on DSTV 421, Go TV 144. Remember, we're streaming live on YouTube. You can send us a WhatsApp vi a video message on 540 109 My name is Gifty Andopia. This is The Pulse. Please be my guest. Welcome to the details of those stories. Now, Ghana's coronavirus cases have now uh, increased to 195 after 34 new cases were announced today. It brings the total number of regions affected to five, with the eastern region the latest region to record a case. So far, Greater Accra region, the Ashanti region, the northern and upper west region have all recorded cases. We have a breakdown of these for you shortly. Uh, but today, top government officials and various officers of state have been updating the nation on Ghana's situation at a news conference. Listen to Health Minister Kwiku Ajmaimenu speak about Ghana's situation. We have recorded 195 cases with five days. The number of regions reporting cases remain five. Greater Accra, Ashanti, Northern, and Upper West. The Greater Accra region has the most cases, 174, followed by the Northern region, 10. The Shant region has nine, Upper West region one, and Eastern region one. Most reported cases now are from routine enhanced surveillance activities. Cases from travelers under mandatory quarantine remain 89. That means that we have taken all their samples, we have done, we have got the those positive and those negative are still in hotels observing the mandatory 14-day quarantine pre period. Cases from travelers under mandatory quarantine remain 89. That is Tamale 10, Accra 79. Whereas cases from routine surveillance currently stands at 106. Accra 95, Kumasi 8, Obwasi 2. As at 08 hours this morning, I'll summarize it in a table form. General surveillance 106, travelers undergoing mandatory quarantine, 79 positive, in Accra and in Tamale, 10. So the total figures, recovered and discharged, 38. Discharged home management, 49. Those in treatment facilities, 138. Dead, 5. 
So we have total reported cases, 195. That's our Health Minister, Kwekwa Jimamenu, the head of our health desk, Fresh Smith, who has been following this from the beginning, was at the briefing. He joins me now in the studio with more. Let's begin with a, a breakdown, Fred, of the cases as have been clarified, so to speak, by the health minister. Well, the Greater Accra region has recorded more cases than any other region. Is the worst affected with 174 cases gifty. Mm. It's followed closely by the northern region. Well, not closely. It's followed by the northern region with 10 cases. And northern region is followed closely mm. by the Ashanti region with nine cases. Okay. The, upper east, uh, the upper west and the eastern regions have one case each. Okay. And um, I'll give you the reason why uh, Eastern Region is recording a case. I'll right. give the so breakdown. So before you go, Fred, this, uh, this is the breakdown, just so our viewers can follow. Uh, you can quickly take a screenshot if you want to just, you know, keep it in mind. Accra, that's it for you. 174 mm -hmm. cases. Ashanti mm -hmm. Region, 9. Mm -hmm. The Upper West Region, 1. Northern, 10. And Eastern, wow. 1. So but let's let me focus on the Eastern Region. You said you give us a, br a br an Because that. that's the latest region to record a case. Okay. And this case was recorded in the lower Manya Kobo municipality mm. of the eastern region and this person we are told is an Indian uh, who works with the construction company they're building the railway line between the eastern region and the Great Accra region Tema to be specific mm. and so uh, those are the details mm, that's uh, an interesting have. detail but Fred this area is an area that's very well known to you what background can you bring to bear uh, on, let's say, the health uh, systems there, the sort of people that live there? What can we know as a way of background? In well, that, that community is a community that has a lot of HIV cases. And so the hospital, the main hospital there is the Atua Government Hospital. Okay. It's usually inundated with persons coming in for one, one health uh, care or the other mm. and so there's a lot of pressure on that facility yeah. already yeah. there are satellite hospitals around but uh, they are not as equipped as a tour government hospital okay. is and so some persons leave the lower Manyakobo area mm. and go to Kofuridia for instance okay. to get health care okay. so uh, it becomes interesting to see the kind of pressure that is going to be yeah. on this facility yeah. and how they will be managed. We'll talk about how the entire situation, according to the ministry, the Minister of Health, is being managed. But you wanted to take us case by case, I mean region by region, and give us an idea what we ought to understand with their figures there. So from the eastern region, do you want to, us to take a look at the, um, the say, uh, upper west region? They also have just one case, and that case happened, I think, about last week. I indeed, one case in the upper west region. Uh, what we had our first few cases from Greater Accra and Ashanti regions, but Ashanti appears to have stabilized. Okay. Personally, I had expected Ashanti cases to go up. Okay. The very day we had someone, uh, that, you know, you recall the first community spread yes. we had was Ashanti, Ashanti region. region. So I was expecting Ashanti to record more cases mm. than Greater Accra. But as it turned out, Greater Accra has recorded more. And M the most important thing to note is that Greater Accra is where all of those who were quarantined, mm -hmm. uh, passengers coming into Ghana who were quarantined, okay. were kept. And so you can expect this. And some more persons have been found with yeah. COVID-19 following contact tracing in Accra. So okay. it makes sense why Accra is at that level. So Kumase, uh, Ashanti region appears to have done very well with okay. management. Uh, we hope that Accra doesn't okay. go up any further. Okay. Let's talk about the measures that uh, the health minister announced today as part of the ways that we, we're dealing with this uh, monstrous uh, virus. Fred. Well, indeed, uh, they've improved contact tracing. And what will happen from now is that if anybody is exposed to the uh, to someone who's tested positive, mm -hmm. what will happen is that the person will be tested. They will not just look at uh, case the, those who meet case definition. They will mm -hmm. test those persons to be sure that they are free of the virus. And in most cases, they do s double testing. If you test negative yeah. this time, they will test you again just after a period sure. of time just to be extra sure. Right. And that's how come there's some clarification being given about the number of recoveries that we've had. Uh, yesterday, the health minister had mentioned that 31 persons, and even today he had mentioned that that number has even gone up to mm. 38. But the point remains that the health, uh, e the experts would want to do double checking okay. before they, they 
finally clear these persons as so we can hear the health minister explain these measures and how they are undertaking the enhanced uh, screening let's go for it UGMC University of Ghana Medical Center that is ready for use training has been completed there are 14 beds for holding area and 14 beds for treatment five ICU beds are also ready so we have UGMC dedicated again some part of the facility to put in patients Bank of Ghana Hospital. I kept on telling the community, the people in Ghana, that the Minister of Health hasn't got direct jurisdiction over Bank of Ghana Hospital. And people were blasting that there are hospitals completed that will not be utilized and all that. We have had engagement with Bank of Ghana, and they have released two floors that will take care of 20 beds for our use. Because the facility doesn't belong to the Minister of Health, Bank of Ghana has agreed that their own people and some VIP personnel will be allowed there. So in case we get some of you here, I VIP people, we are likely to take you to Bank of Ghana Hospital. Why are you laughing? You are all VIP people. In this material, <laughs> Okay. So I'll underscore the fact that we are ready to take people in and uh, make sure they are getting well. Right, so that's the health minister there, but Indeed, he's talking, he was talking about, about, about the health, health facilities. facilities. Right. He talked about some new facilities that will now take the persons. The East Hospital, mm. for instance, has a capacity of about 100. It's now taking about 50. Yeah. And so the Bank of Ghana Hospital is also giving uh, part of the facility, which will take about 20. And then the University of Ghana okay. Medical Center is also taking part of it and so mm. uh, it improves the health facilities that we have you recall during the peak of the chinese crisis mm. the the coronavirus cases right. in china they had to build Two new hospitals, new hospitals yeah. uh, within some record time mm. yes ghana doesn't have to do Whether that because yet, we don't have that okay. that many mm. numbers and so the facilities what we have are enough but the minister also talked about the measures, the, the enhanced testing to, that right, I exactly. talked about. Get, so we can hear him address that issue right. now. Okay. So far, we have deployed several teams in Accra and Kumasi. They are working now. And people that are being contacted are cooperating very, very, very well. And we believe if you are able to do this exercise successfully, the chain that we want to break will get broken and we'll have no challenges in our country. That is the exercise we have mounted. The necessary materials and logistics that these teams need have been given. They are going around with security officials and immigration people and um, disease control officers in the districts, epidemiologists, the field officers. They are all part of the teams that are moving. And we believe that with your cooperation, things will be okay for us. We will continue to give updates on the type of numbers they are reaching up to. In Accra, we now have 140 teams in the areas that we have debarkated to actually trace people in. So far, between Monday and Tuesday, they have contacted 635 people, and 589 samples have been taken. They have all been sent to Noguchi. We have also started testing in Kolebu, the Infectious Disease Reference Laboratory. So the tests will now become a bit larger and results will come a bit earlier. In Kumasi, we have deployed 40 teams. They started a bit late yesterday, but they have contacted 160 people. 
and they have collected 22 samples. We are pushing them to up their game today so that they can get closer to the targets we have set for them. Things are working for us. The good news is that some people are being contacted on telephone to try to find their locations, and they are also cooperating. Yesterday, somebody called me and praised government on the efforts that we have put in so far. The person came in earlier, before quarantine. He had been called on telephone, contacted, they've given her where she should go for her sample to be taken. She went there, they took her sample, and she was so happy awaiting the test results. Not just one isolated case. So the contacts can be physical, one-on-one, -on -one, can be on telephone, but we request that Ghanaians should cooperate with us, and we believe we can break the chain. So that's the health minister there explaining, um, Fred, the tests. Then the fact that we need to, the more tests you conduct, the more you get to know how many people have this uh, condition. But we've been, obviously, everybody has been hungry for good news. And so mm -hmm. yesterday when we heard about the recoveries, we we're very excited. But after today's press conference, it appears that there were some clarifications needed. Tell us about it whilst we hear from the uh, information minister. Well, the health minister had actually today indicated that the numbers he gave yesterday, 31, had gone up to 38. Okay. Uh, but they needed to clarify a few things because a lot of these people had you know, showed signs of recovery, okay. but they needed to do extra testing to conclude that they had fully recovered. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Kojo Pankroma, who is the information minister, gave that clarification. We can hear him make that clarification. So we get the exact numbers as they are, mm -hmm. according to the experts. All right. I'll just ask you to pay attention to the further nuanced uh, data that we have provided. I mentioned that we'll explain why we are um, nuancing the data some more. Uh, because sometimes if you just take the ballpark figure 195 and you don't understand the categories, people actually even end up getting scared. And that's why uh, as we go on, we try to nuance the data some more so that uh, it creates context for us. So Ghana's case count as of this morning, as the Honorable Minister mentioned, is 195. But it's in different categories. The general surveillance proper in the population is 106. That is the general surveillance in the population uh, as has been captured so far. Out of those 106, three have been discharged because they have recovered. What that means is that the tests have taken place and they have tested negative after treatment or after supportive treatment. So they are discharged and recovered. There's another category of discharged for home management. What, like the Honorable Minister mentioned, it means that they are no longer showing any uh, visible symptoms. They don't appear sick or ill. They are uh, going through the final bits of their treatment so that they can test negative finally. So you'll find that that's about 18. Then those who are in facilities but are responding very well to treatment, who we are hoping will be moved either home or uh, 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 discharged, recovered finally, that's 80. Unfortunately, we have lost five persons, and I think the context of how we lost them has already been provided. That's what gives us the 106. Now, in Accra, when the mandatory quarantine was introduced, um, a total of 79 persons tested positive. None of them at this stage has been discharged on basis of recovery. But 31 of them have now been moved home for treatment because the, um, the risk profiling shows that there are people who can be treated at home. 48 of them are being treated in facilities, but they are responding very well to treatment. None of them is critical, none of them is dead. That's how we arrive at the 79. In Tamale, the 10 persons who were uh, put in quarantine and tested, uh, none of them has been uh, discharged on basis of recovery, none of them has been discharged for home management. Uh, but as at now, while we are waiting to complete the diplomatic um, protocol so that we can have them go back to their countries of origin to continue their treatment. They are currently responding to uh, the levels of treatment that the doctors there are paying attention uh, to. And I'll give some quick uh, clarification on that because the brief we have is that um, at the time they came into the jurisdiction, the borders had not been closed. And that is how come they were put in quarantine for, I think, 11 days prior to which they are um, Tests and results came in. So, Honorable Ministers, brief is qualified accordingly. 
and then um, you come to the total. So that means three persons totally have been discharged because they have recovered. 49 persons have been discharged for home uh, treatment for the final bits of their treatment. 138 are in facilities, uh, but are responding to treatment. We are very hopeful and optimistic uh, about that. Uh, unfortunately, five persons have died. That's how come we arrive at the 195. So some clarity there for you, just in case uh, you, get, you got it twisted, some clarity there by the minister for you. I'd like to take to you to the eastern region where uh, a first case, well, the region recorded its first case. Kofi Siaw is our correspondent there joining me on the line. Hello, Kofi. Hello, Gifty. Kofi, tell us about this new case that was recorded in your, well, in your region. You know, Gifty, in the morning, when, if you recall, the information minister during his a press conference uh, actually confirmed that one case has been recorded and that is the first case in the eastern region so mm. we were a bit worried residents here were a bit worried as to where this case is coming from so as a journalist i start to find out from the health directors in the various districts you know for them to confirm to me whether uh, the minister's statement is true or not so mm. when i called the lower menace Municipal uh, Health Director, is Mark Sarkodier. Right. He told me that it is true. The case has been confirmed to be positive, and that as he speaks with me in the morning, uh, officials from the Regional Health Directorate, inclu including the Regional Director of Health Services, mm -hmm. were all in the municipality to you know, visit the place where the case has been confirmed to be positive so that they can immediately take action on okay. that. So as I speak with you, mm -hmm. the Municipal Health Director has confirmed the case to be positive to joining. Well, the case has been confirmed, but then what, what, what are people in the area saying about this? Well, they, 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 are, they are surprised. Some are very, very much surprised because of uh, the fact that during the week there's been a new going viral on radio and TV, some in social media about the outbreak of uh, the disease hmm. in do, do we the know, Do we know whether his, uh, whoever it is, whether it's a male or female, has been, has had um, the people he's been in contact with traced at all? Did the health minister, uh, the, the regional directorate of health say anything at all about tracing the people he may have come into contact with? Well, this person we are talking about, according to the Municipal Health Director, is an Indian who is working with a company uh, that is building the rail from hmm. Apostumbo in the eastern region. So uh, are, they, are they contacting the people who work in this yes, construction? Yes, yes, yes. As hmm. I speak with you, the health officials are in the area and they say they are doing contact tracing right. to persons he, they think he might have come into contact with. Okay. Kofi, thank you very much for that update. Uh, Kofi Siang there. Um, Fred, so Kofi Siang is reporting that the Municipal Health Director, uh, Directorate has just told him they are working on this con uh, con contact tracing or the people who work within this uh, construction firm. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, construction firms were exempt or are exempt uh, as far as this lockdown the is concerned. The restrictions, yeah. So it would be interesting to know what decision the authorities take regarding the construction of that rail line because a lot of his colleagues mm. will still be at work. Do you okay. continue to keep them there? Uh, maybe that's what uh, mm. Kofi Sian would have to find out and right. update us on. Perhaps a quick quarantine there as well. We'll certainly be following up on that case. But Fred, let's bring it back home. Have you tested? Well, I've <laughs> not, but I have people around me, very close to me, testing. <laughs> okay. And so. it's negative. Yeah, so. <laughs> very well. <laughs> I say that. I mean, and I'm smiling because we're going to talk about the first family. Mm -hmm. And we're told by the physician, the uh, President Kufado's physician, that he's tested. And um, his family members have also tested. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, he, he's, he's tested. You recall that at the start of our cases, the president had just returned from mm -hmm. a trip to some European countries, mm. including Norway and the United Kingdom and Switzerland, uh, Switzerland right. where cases had been recorded mm. at the time he was there. And so uh, there were rumors going around that the president needed to test to be to be clear mm. that he doesn't have uh, coronavirus. Indeed, uh, he's taking the test according to uh, his personal physician, uh, Dr. Uh, Petrina Ankara who says the first family are doing very well. In fact, 
their staff about they they're all about 99 persons they've all tested negative for COVID-19 so we can hear her speak right um, on a day before the president's birthday we had to we, we tested him the first lady um, his daughters and all the staff all his household and then I'm happy to announce that all the tests came back negative a day after his birthday we continue to test people in the secretariat including myself because we tend to deal with him on, one, on a one-to-one -one basis. And as I speak now, a total of 99 people have been tested and the results have come back negative. We continue, the, we are continuing this process and in, as and when there is, we hope that everybody will test negative. Um, The, I know the Ministry of Health and the Ghana Health Service are continuing the process. The president is, as much as he said, very hard working, standing, being in, chairing a lot of meetings, staying up late. So we sort of, we, I am on him to make sure that he's observing the social distancing. If any of you observe that he's not wearing the mask, which a lot of questions have been asked, is he's observing the social distancing strictly, and then he's, we're making sure that he's washing his hands very often, frequently, and then he is also using his sanitizers as well. So that is the president's personal physician, Dr. Petrina uh, Techi Ankra, there, who uh, told us about the, uh, those tests. Fred, we're going to talk about the vulnerable. This is a conversation that we highlighted very strongly yesterday in all of our bulletins. Well, before we go on to talk about what government is putting, or what measures government is putting in place to cushion people who are homeless, people who are, are you know, vulnerable, take a look at this report filed by PSE uh, Nanaya Safo yesterday. They had planned to travel back home to Walewale to escape the Accra Kumasi lockdown which took effect on Monday. Living on the streets of Accra, they certainly had nowhere to call home, so they paid a driver 150 cities each to take them home. But the driver and his mate bolted with their money, leaving them stranded. Nafisa Amidu and fellow scores of headquarters in Tudu believed they could not possibly self-isolate in the streets. <laughs> Nafisa could have braved it alone without a place to lay her head, but now she has an infant to take care of. Nafisa, her baby, and scores of other women and children were found by the AMA patrol team hiding in a cargo truck at 5.30 a.m., bound to travel to Walewale. An enclosed space, not wide enough to have two individuals at arm's length. Trampoline for roofing sheets with buckets hanging and extensive heat. This has been the home for over 20 headquarters and their children for about two days continuously. They do not have any windows to breathe. I'm surrounded here by several buckets. Some of the, the various things that they've been living by, including these black slippers belonging to a child. Also, uh, behind me, there are several pants that are strapped. There's a plastic chair uh, strapped to that side. Hanging on the trampoline are buckets uh, for bathing purposes, for working purposes, and so many others. They also have Kitchen stools uh, that are also used uh, very com commonly in the local setting. They were covered with all these items that we can see uh, here. There are also cups that they've been using uh, in their daily uh, activities. And this was the corner that was home to them for about two days continuously. Now that the vehicle has been impounded, they do not know of their fate. The headquarters, popularly called Kayaye, have one wish, to go back home. Deputy Minister for Food and Agriculture, who also doubles as MP for Walewale constituency, Dr. Sagre Bambangi, assured the women that they will be well fed. Some processes have already begun for us to find out uh, an amicable solution to this problem. So 
In actual fact, the uh, disease control uh, unit of the AMA is screening them currently. They are doing some basic protocols uh, to be sure of the next, you know, uh, strategy. At least we can guarantee that they will be fed uh, to, uh, today from morning, uh, from this time till evening. We can confirm that. That one I can confirm. Yes. A philanthropist in the Accra Metropolitan Assembly provided food for the headquarters. Head of Public Affairs for the AMA, Gilbert Ankara, says the police service is assisting the outfit to do full investigations. We, we have currently informed the police and uh, as I speak to you now, uh, we've had indication that they are on their way coming. So we are waiting for them to come and then uh, help uh, them go through the necessary protocols. But where these headquarters and their babies will be kept remains unanswered. PSCA Nanaya Osafo, join news. PSCA Nanaya Osafo filed that report. So where are they? What is going to happen to them? Fresh Mesh, what does the Gender and Social Protection Ministry say? Well, they are in Accra. They are part of 15,000 people that the Gender Ministry and the other ministries responsible for mm -hmm. their area are looking at so they're going to provide those who don't have accommodation accommodation for this period and then uh, beyond this they also give them food and then some stipend so they can be comfortable during this uh, lockdown period mm -hmm. they're also looking for persons with uh, mental illness on the streets they're also going to take care of persons with disability during this period and then uh, support them through the lockdown period uh, but what you saw down there as we speak, mm -hmm. the gender minister and other ministers, the national security minister and others are currently at the location where they are being housed and uh, we still have our reporters following that so uh, as, as and when they come through with their reports we will bring it to our mm -hmm. viewers. So we can hear the gender minister speak at the news conference on the measures they've put in place to make life a bit comfortable for these ones. Mm -hmm and everyone. The Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection has come out with mitigating measures to safeguard the health and well-being of the vulnerable groups in Ghana amid the coronavirus pandemic and subsequent lockdown of the affected areas of Ghana. That is Kumasi, Accra, Tema and Kaswa. In view of the above, the ministry is implementing the following measures. We had meetings with COVID-19 planning committee that the national security, not more in the Ministry of Finance, updated the CAIA data for visiting various marketplaces with their leaders. I personally went around the markets where we have most of our CAIA to make sure that at least we have a forehand information on how things are going. Then we went to where they live, so at least we know that some of them are residents, they've rented little apartments and they live in, and we have those who also live on the streets. We have also visited some facilities where we think it's suitable to accommodate our brothers and sisters on the street. We have a few men, that is why I had brothers and sisters on the street. Those with that place of abode, drawing, we are going to keep them for the two weeks that we have imposed these measures. We, are, we currently have like 15,000 of them that we are going to cater for. For those who have the apartment, we'll find ways of sending logistics to them to keep them away from coming to town. And for those that we are going to keep at the identified places that we have found, we are going to cater for them. There's going to be enough food, there's going to be enough water. We have corporate bodies cooking for like 6,000 and other group cooking like for 4,000. So all in all, we have enough food for them. We are also sending food two people on the street. We have like the mental retarded people. We are picking 20 and they are going to be cleaned. They are not going to come back on the street. 20 of them, the facility tells us that they can only take 20 and keep clean. And the others we are going to feed. So we are going to give them food every day. Give them food, give them water twice a day. 
Um, we haven't thought of the, um, the breakfast yet, so we are still looking through. We have drinks and things, so we'll supply them with, and then the medical assistance that we can provide for them also. The food we are going to provide are going to, is going to be hot meal, and I will entreat if we can get the journalists go around and see exactly what we are saying, whether it's being complied. That's Agenda Minister Cynthia Morris in there. Fred, let's wrap up with what the soldiers are saying. Well, the, there were accusations, mm -hmm. and if you monitored social media, videos going around that the soldiers are abusing uh, Ghanaians who were moving about during this lockdown period. And it, it's been denied. The Brigadier General A.Y. Nsia, he's uh, leading the operations, and he says there's only been one infraction during this period, and even that it doesn't involve assaults, uh, it's, it's a case where they've recalled the soldier involved and investigations are underway. Okay. So we can hear him explain or respond to the criticism. Let's go for it. Some videos is gone viral concerning some brutalities uh, being meted out by some soldiers to some civilians. Let me assure my fellow Ghanaians that the soldiers that you have are well trained, they are professionals, they don't brutalize. We have deployed close to 1,000 soldiers in the field. Out of this number, we have had only one incident, and that incident had nothing to do with slapping. It is something that we've, we thought is not of our standard, and that we are dealing with it. That soldier involved presently have been withdrawn back to the barracks, and I have tasked the military police to go into the matter and investigate. So all the videos you are seeing, they are false. I do not know the intention behind it. But whatever it is, be assured that your soldiers are professionals. They don't brutalize. We don't allow it, and we are never going to allow it. I go around myself and educate them. Before the deployment, I tax the head of the legal department of the Ghana Army to go to the centers where we come them before we deploy them to town. Four different centers, one in Bema, two in Bema Camp, Arakan and the Gunda Barras, then one in Weji Barras, then one in Michel Camp. He went around and educated them about our rules of engagement. They were very key to us. I personally went around myself. The commanding officers also spoke to them. So it is never true that our soldiers have been brutalizing our Ghanaians. We will not do it. We, the, we, those in command, will not permit it. I want to emphasize that most, most of us Ghanaians are religious. We are either Christians or Muslims or traditional religious uh, worshipers. And we know that telling lies about somebody is something that God does not permit. So those who are doing it, I don't know what your agenda is. Please, God does not permit what you are doing. Stop it. And that has been the punchline of the day. It says God does not permit uh, lies. Stop that. That's General Officer Commanding Headquarters, Southern Command, Brigadier General A.Y. Uh, in CFR. It's been an interesting morning for you, I, I suppose, yeah, as usual. Yeah, it has been uh, covering this news conference. Uh, but more importantly, monitoring what's going on in town regarding the lockdown and yeah. compliance. Uh, I see less people in town today than I did yesterday, yesterday. and the day before. So uh, I think we're getting there. The, the uh, military or security on ground have said that they are going to tighten their uh, enforcement. So anybody who wants to go out, be sure that it's absolutely necessary. Uh, you're going for food mm -hmm. or you're going for drugs and people want to just go up and down for food and come back and go out for food and go for drugs and go back <laughs> and go in, and do something that's important and you heard in a video a viral video of a man who came from Kaswa lied to the security that he was going to get medicine at circle he got to circle and did a video and said oh wow look I came here. I just, I just came to see how people are complying. <laughs> <laughs> you can trust Ghanaians to create a lot of laughter from this. But hey, this is a serious issue. If you have no business go going out, just stay at home. 
and stop the spread. Uh, later on Frontline here today, you'll hear a passionate appeal by doctors urging you to stay at home and stop the spread. Fred, thank you so much. Fred Smith is head of our health desk here, helping us with that press conference earlier today. I'm going to take a very quick break. When I return, we'll take a look at what's happening globally as far as COVID-19 is concerned. This is the pulse. And here you have everything coronavirus, all the information, all the clarification you need. And we also give you the platform to show some love to all our frontline workers to stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. Right now, let's take a look at the global picture. What is happening around the world? Well, Germany is one of the areas of focus for us. Indeed, Europe has been. We've taken a look at what's happening in Italy and the pressure that uh, health officials and health system has come under as far as uh, dealing with coronavirus is concerned. I'm going to take you to Europe now. We're going straight to Germany where Thomas Sparrow a political correspondent with our partners DW is standing by to give us a briefing on the European situation. Thomas, it's good to have you once again. Thank you. Well, Thomas, I'm just going to go straight to ask you. Nice to um, be with you, Gifty. Right. Right. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and ask you about uh, what the latest is uh, looking at Europe, Italy, Germany. What's the latest update? One of the latest developments here, Gifty, is that the current restrictions that are underway, that were imposed by the government a few days ago, those restrictions that we spoke about on the on the program and which involve people being asked to stay at home and uh, meetings of more than two people being banned, so people are supposed to stay at home, although that uh, those measures are not compulsory. People can still go to work if they desperately need to. But those measures have been extended beyond uh, Easter. Germany is seeing important developments when it comes to the increased rate of people infected. That increased rate is actually going down, and it's basically the right direction that Germany wants to take that, but it's still not enough for Germany and German authorities to lift those restrictions to social interactions, and that's the reason why the government, the federal government, but also regional governments, announced that the restrictions that are currently in place will continue to be in place until the 19th of April at least. Mm. Over here in Ghana, we're still uh, we're in day three of a 14-day restriction. Thomas, let's now talk about a repatriation program by the German government that brought uh, people from around the world, Germans from around the world, back to uh, Germany. Some of them, including persons who were here um, in Ghana. What do we know about the sort of people that came in? That's correct, Gifty. This is a very big program, actually, by the German government. The German government has earmarked for this uh, repatriation program around 50 million euros. It has carried many, many flights so far from different parts of the world, trying to bring back German tourists that, because of all these worldwide restrictions to travel, are stranded in different parts of the world. So around 150,000 to 170,000 German tourists have already been able to return to Germany with the help of the German government. But there are still particular pockets, countries, where this is becoming more difficult. I'll give you one concrete example. New Zealand. Uh, there was one flight from New Zealand with German tourists, but afterwards New Zealand imposed restrictions which are making it more difficult for Germans to actually get to the airports for them to be able to transport it back to Germany. Uh, so basically all flights uh, from New Zealand have been stopped for now. And this just gives you one example of how difficult this is. You mentioned correctly that there was also a flight from uh, Ghana uh, German tourists in uh, Ghana and all this has to do with the fact that German authorities have told Germans to stop traveling uh, they have told Germans to stay at home they have issued a global travel warning and as such all Germans who are abroad who 
do not live abroad but who live in Germany but were for example simply abroad as work and travel or who were abroad as exchange students or simply tourists have been asked to return and the German government has put this uh, program in place to try and help them to come back and avoid them being stranded in those respective countries and carrying with all the cost costs that that involves having to pay hotels for weeks or even try and find out that there are no flights back to Europe on time. Well, I'm sure that none of those who were repatriated from Ghana has um, COVID-19. Hopefully, they've all been tested. But, but, but let's talk about the health system uh, in Germany. Germany is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. But we've seen how the entire world is reeling under this uh, COVID-19, how the United States as well, China, are all suffering from this. Tell us about the German health system and how it is supporting uh, COVID-19. What can we learn from such a system? Gifty, the German health system is considered one of the most advanced in the world, but it is uh, very important to say that this pandemic is also revealing its weaknesses. There are reports of staff shortages, of equipment shortages. There are reports of unnecessary bureaucracy. There are reports of lacking digitalization, of doctors needing to improvise more and more because uh, they do not have the necessary equipment or the necessary staff to carry out all the different uh, activities that they have to carry out now specifically when you have so many people wanting to have access to that healthcare system and that's why on the one hand the German government has passed two packages to try and uh, expedite uh, these kinds of reactions to try and help hospitals mm. that might be particularly affected and at the same time for example the city of Berlin has announced that it intends to build a, a new hospital to house around 500 or 500 to 1,000 uh, patients. At the same time, Gifty, it's important to stress that Germany does have more intensive care beds uh, per 100,000 inhabitants than other countries in Europe, and that has allowed uh, the German government to, for example, offer helping hand to countries that are more affected by this, like France or like Italy, and that's why. Uh, some patients from France or, ha or from Italy have been brought to Germany to have their coronavirus treatment here in this country because Germany has the space available at the moment. So basically the goal that the German authorities have, and that's by the way a goal that other governments around the world have, is to so-called flatten the curve. In other words, to make sure that the healthcare system is not overloaded, that the healthcare system can cope with the number of people infected step by step and without being overwhelmed. Well, Thomas, I'm going to take a very final word from you. Um, hopefully, we won't have to get there. Here in Ghana, we're just about uh, getting around 190 uh, cases. There are about five people have died, but I, I, I dare say that our health system has not yet been as overwhelmed. But still, we celebrate those at the front lines, and I believe that in Germany as well. Let me take your final words. And how do those at the front lines react to some of these pressures that they're having to soak in? Gifty, this is particularly important and that's why I think the, the project that you have, that idea of, of speaking directly to those on the front lines or thanking them for their work is so important, not only in Ghana, but also in other parts of the world. Germany has also joined uh, in uh, thanking, for example, healthcare work workers, but not only healthcare workers, for example, also those who have to work in these very difficult times, for example, those who work at a supermarket, those who work at a pharmacy, who work non-stop to try and offer help to other people. And this is something that we've seen also in other parts of, of Europe as well, in Italy and Spain in particular. There are moments during the day where you can hear people clapping to honor those that are uh, working to try and take care of others who are affected by this situation. So I think it's very important, Gifty, in these very difficult times to also try and take a moment to thank those people who are particularly vested in trying to make sure that everyone is, is healthy or remains healthy yeah. and try and find the positives also in this because it's not only about people dying and people getting mm -hmm. sick but it's also a moment to try and reflect and try and understand that there are very positive elements in society as well and that if we all work together, if we all collaborate then we will all be able to try and uh, well, at least we'll become better persons after this crisis ends. So it's not only, again, about those very difficult moments and difficult situations, it's also trying to find those very special moments that can also be found. And one of those special moments that I've been able to find personally 
uh, those sentiments of gratitude towards, for example, health workers right. or, or other people who are working nonstop to help others during these very difficult times. That's true. And we'll take some time as we go along the days to celebrate uh, to celebrate uh, all of those people. Do not call our line. It's just for WhatsApp messages. Uh, we'll take some time to celebrate all those people. And Thomas, we'll look forward to getting some of those videos of appreciation, for example, uh, from Germany or, or other parts of Europe so we can share it with the rest of Ghana and see what we can learn from that. Thomas, thank you. Thomas Sparrow is political correspondent with our partners, DW, joining us all the way uh, from Berlin. I'm going to take you to South Africa, but like I said, do not call my line, please. This is just for WhatsApp. It is not for uh, phone calls, so do not disturb everybody else by calling. Uh, I'm going to take you to South Africa right now. Like I said, here on the polls, we give you everything coronavirus where you don't get on any channel at all. It's a world tour. In South Africa, it's Duduzile Ramela. She's a freelance journalist. We're so grateful. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. What is the latest in South Africa? All right, we're trying to get uh, Didizile Ramela there. You saw her. Uh, we're trying to get her so we can get through to speak to her right now. But if you do have any video, like I said, uh, you can just record yourself saying thank you to the frontline workers. And I'll have a frontline worker here in the studio uh, subsequently. So we'll talk about when we even say frontline workers, who are they? Who can we put in that line so that we can channel our appreciation appropriately? Um, is it just everybody in within the health sector? Is it about the security service uh, uh, agents who are out there making sure that you stay at home, uh, enforcing the lockdown, so to speak, so that the disease doesn't spread? Is it about that watch seller who is still exchanging money or taking your money, um, the risk that she's exposed to, taking those monies, etc.? Is it about us as journalists who go out there talking to people with our microphones? Who do we put on that list? Um, to be celebrated. But the, by the way, I celebrate you that you're at home, that you're taking time to stop the spread. Let's go to South Africa. Duduzile Ramela is joining us uh, from there. Hello, uh, Ramela, can you hear me? A very good evening to you. Right, thank you. I was just asking for you to give us an update on the South African situation. Sure. Um, as of yesterday, the health ministry coming out to give us so they announced that 1,153 people are positive with coronavirus and reporting, unfortunately, five deaths, five too many. Um, the lockdown is in day six in South Africa. We're still restricted in terms of movement. Shops open very early, they close very early. Alcohol is still not on sale. Cigarettes are still not on sale. Only essential service workers are allowed um, to vote. And also, with that, you need. Um, interesting development in terms of it today is that the transport uh, majority of South Africa uh, taxis, I think it's in Ghana, so something similar like in, in a taxi, you find a lot of people um, inside the taxi, something like 15 people inside the taxi. So, friction that you only take in 70 in terms of. I'm, I'm struggling to hear you, um, Duduzile. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if we'll have to try and reconnect maybe via phone so we can hear you clearly, if that's going to work properly. Um, perhaps we'll try and do that because Skype isn't working uh, as smoothly as we had expected. But Duduzile is a freelance uh, journalist in South Africa. We're going to try and raise her on the telephone, um, hopefully, so you get that update. But what she was saying is that South Africa is still in lockdown. Um, they were in lockdown for 21 days. We're supposed to be in lockdown for 21 days. We here are doing it for 14 days. They were 21 days. That started about last week, Thursday. They're still in it. She says that you still need a permit to go out there. She's talking about the need, even if you have the need to buy a cigarette, you need a um, uh, permit to be able to do that. She was talking about the taxi situation and of course it wasn't so smooth so I couldn't really hear her what she was saying on that. But you know the situation here in Ghana. Taxis are allowed to move but you cannot take too many people in that taxi. Uh, even if it's an Uber you're, about to, you're allowed to take about I think one or two people uh, on Uber. We want to see what the South African situation is when Duduzile Romela joins us again on the mobile phone. I'm going to take you back to South Africa where Duduzile Romela is standing by. We've been trying to uh, hook up with her to 
to find out the South African situation, always learning from one another as countries that are all affected. It is really, thank you uh, for your patience, really. Uh, you were telling us about the South African situation. Please go ahead. Uh, where we lost each other, but I, maybe I'll just start from the beginning. Yeah. So 1,353 cases with five deaths, um, unfortunately. Uh, those are numbers from the Department of Health coming out uh, yesterday. We're still on day six of the national lockdown. By and large, you know, um, in, in suburban areas, people very much adhering to uh, the restrictions of no movement, not even, you know, uh, walking your dog, but people able to go and buy food and essentials. Um, in our townships, however, the situation is very different. So on Monday and Tuesday, we saw a situation where it was time for grant payments. And so the elderly in South Africa um, and the disabled and other uh, the categories of uh, grant payments received their grants. Uh, but we saw long queues. There was no social distancing. Uh, people weren't wearing masks, but they needed to get their money. Um, an interesting development today uh, in terms of transport, the transport ministry coming out, they had imposed um, rules to say, or regulations rather, to say that there will be no public transport, right? But today they came out to say that there will be public transport, but from certain hours. So from 5 a.m. until 10 a.m., taxis will be allowed to operate. Between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., they're not allowed to operate. They resume again their operations from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. So that extension being given of an hour. A majority of South Africans using public transport. Um, and so there, there's been um, quite a, a bit of a difficult situation because yesterday, taxi drivers or taxi associations were threatening a strike, saying this is our daily bread. How are we then um, supposed to, to, to live? Uh, but by and large, day six of the national lockdown, I think South Africa, we, we're not there yet. The message is probably slowly but surely seeping in, uh, but we're not there yet. Interesting. Uh, here in Ghana, public transport is allowed, but they are expected to observe social distancing. Are they, are they uh, transport, the public transport in South Africa allowed to take the normal, usual number of people that a vehicle is, is able to contain? Or is there, uh, are there restrictions on that as well? So there are restrictions. So you'll find that, for instance, in a taxi that can take, what, something like 14 passengers, mm -hmm. uh, now they're expected to take only 70% uh, of that. And also under strict um, rules that they should be giving passengers masks and they should be giving them sanitizers. Government has made a commitment that they will give the taxi drivers uh, the necessary sanitizers and the necessary masks um, that they need. Also emphasizing uh, the public, the transport minister today to citizens that, you know, you need to take this upon yourself to protect yourself. Do not enter into a taxi um, if there are no masks for you to wear. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I grew up on public transport. I grew up in a taxi. Um, and it, it's quite impossible to even open a window for air without somebody saying, hey, I'm cold. Um, so to see how this is going to be um, rolled out will be very interesting. I say that because on the issue of you know the lockdown, it's not everywhere that we see um, police presence or military presence in yeah. terms of blocking off roads to say, who are you, where are you going? So I think the implementation of this lockdown, the implementation uh, of all of these measures that they're bringing in um, is, is going to be very critical in us turning the tide where this is concerned. Interesting uh, developments there. Well, uh, one of the things that have come up here, that, uh, that has come up here in Ghana, uh, is that uh, people are complaining that the security agency uh, officials who are enforcing the lockdown are physically abusing some people. Is this a story that we can tell for South Africa as well? Sure. Um, I mean, we had a police officer who was arrested uh, for shooting people who were congregated uh, last week. Um, we were reporting on that on Monday. And also we have had incidents of people complaining to say that, you know, the police are a little bit uh, heavy-handed. And, and it's in contrast to what the president had said when he said that he is deploying the military to be out on the streets. He said, this is not for you to exercise a heavy hand on citizens, but it is for you to make sure that you have the citizens understand, um, you know, but the reaction to that, to be honest with you, is that, you know, there's two schools of thought on that. Uh, the one school of thought says that, well, what do you want, really? Do you want us to turn the tides? Do you want us to really, you know, not get to a situation where we are like Italy? Because our healthcare system cannot take the burden that if 
the world trends or anything to go by that will come for us. Um, you know, we have an issue of, of, of ventilators. Do we produce our own ventilators or do we import ventilators? You find mostly that we import ventilators. And the other school of thought says, well, you know, you, need, you can't be too heavy handed. Um, just make people understand. So there's been a catch-22 where that is concerned, but we have been receiving some reports of heavy-handedness. Right. right. Let's wrap up, uh, to Zeli, with uh, your very final words. Uh, if there's anything else we ought to know before we talk to you next time. I think it's not just a, a South Africa situation. I think it's a continental situation. Mm -hmm. I think what coronavirus has done, and I speak as an African and not as a journalist, is that it has really brought to the fore the things that we should have done a long time ago mm -hmm. as a people to give dignity and quality of life for the average African citizen. Um, Speaking of the production of ventilators, that's something that we should be producing right here mm -hmm. at home. So I think that, you know, in the midst of this and even after this, once we come out on the other side, we really need to take a hard look at ourselves as a continent and do better for our people. Well, next time we talk to you, we'll be looking at how uh, frontline workers are being uh, celebrated there. Here on the show, we're dedicating a segment to celebrating people who come directly in contact uh, with people in these times. So hopefully we'll get mm -hmm. some stories there from South Africa. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Duduzile Romela is a freelance journalist with South Africa, giving us an update. Well, it sounds pretty uh, similar to what we're experiencing here, except they are looking at much more days, 21 days. When we are looking at um, 14 days, South Africa is already in day six, she said. And the taxis, they are allowed to work within a period of time, so they're not allowed to work throughout. It's allowed to work from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., she said, uh, because South Africans like us rely heavily on public uh, transport. Well, the story seems the same. We're going to take a look at the global picture. Um, what's happening? Let's take a look at our chats. Um, well, so that is uh, Johns Hopkins uh, updated uh, website. Uh, it's updated constantly. We're going to take a look at any of these countries uh, that there is. Let's start perhaps with the United States of America. It looks like the United States of America has uh, overtaken um, China on that list there. In the U.S., we're looking at 4,102 Yes, that's quite a lot because so far 190,089 people have uh, uh, cases have been recorded. Out of that, 4,000, 7,141 have died. Bear in mind that the United States is also in a moment where usually they'll have flu, they'll be dealing with flu. Um, and so 7,000 people, 7,141 people have recovered, 4,102. That's the United States situation. Italy, one of the hardest hit countries so far with their health system reeling under this coronavirus. Let's take a look at what's there. 105,792 cases there so far. 12,428 people have killed. Now, uh, Italy is one of those, those countries that have recorded 900 deaths in one day. Now, that is absolutely critical. 15,000, by the way, 729 have recovered in Italy. Let's say a prayer for Italy as we pray for ourselves. Spain is another country. Now, it looks as though they're arranging it according to the countries with the severest cases. So from the United States, Italy, Spain, take a look at uh, Spain. 102,136 cases and the total people number of people who have died 9053 now these are figures but these are human beings as well thankfully 22,647 people have been declared recovered bear in mind as well again that even after you have recovered they were seeing reports that there is still the chance for you to be reinfected um, China where it all started 82,361, we've seen the numbers declining favorably for China. 3,316 people have so far died. 76,000 people uh, plus 405 have recovered in China. Um, we've already spoken to you about Germany. Let's move on quickly uh, to look at uh, some countries perhaps in Africa. Um, but yeah, if you do log on uh, to the Johns Hopkins uh, website, you can get all of those updates there. Let's take a look at what's happening in other African countries right now, shall we? 
Okay, so let's take a look at Burkina Faso. You know that we share a, a border with Burkina. We share borders actually with Burkina Faso. 261 cases, They're slightly above us. Uh, but yeah, we are at 190. Well, we seem to be following. Burkina Faso has 14 people dying. Um, some in top official position as well, positions as well, government positions as well. 32 people have so far recovered, which is not so bad. A good thing there uh, as well. What, what's happening in Senegal? Um, in Senegal, 190 confirmed cases. So we're almost in the same league with Senegal, except that we have five deaths. Senegal has one death and 45. A lot more people have recovered in Senegal. Let's see the final country, Cote d'Ivoire. What's happening? Well, we'll come back and do Nigeria as well, but let's take a look at Cote d'Ivoire. In Cote d'Ivoire, they've recorded 179 cases. One person has died, seven people have recovered. That's the story in Ivory Coast. And finally, let's take a look at our neighbor, our neighbors, um, Nigeria. We do, we do know that we trade a lot. We actually live with Nigeria. 151 cases so far. Two people have died, nine people were told have recovered so far. Right now, let's take a look at how we are enforcing, or our state agencies are enforcing the lockdown. Our tour through town today revealed general adherence to that directive uh, for people to stay at home despite the lockdown entering day three. So Nancy M. Fajra Dosive has been visiting the Carnishian Circle uh, areas and she's reporting the streets have been largely deserted while police and military officers checking uh, drivers have hand sanitizers uh, in their vehicles are also doing their job. Take a look. Just two weeks ago, you'd have found traders dotted across this footbridge. You'd also hear them calling out passers-by with greetings and hails just to get them or entice them to buy their wares. You'd also hear the sound of trotros and car horns glaring and piercing the air, just calling out passengers to board their vehicles. But today the situation is different. Kanishi is at peace. What you only hear are vehicles that pass by and honking but nothing like the noise that you hear on a regular day. Behind me are traders who are in the market today. Even though, yes, they have been asked to return to the market, I've seen just very few people who go to the market to buy their wares. Also, vehicles are not dotted across the street and calling out passengers. The streets are quite empty. We've been largely encouraged and directed to hashtag stay at home. But I've met a few people even on this footbridge. They have been explaining what they're doing here at the Kanishi Market. I'm a trader here at the Kanishi Market. I'm having shops over here. And I'm having plenty of biscuits. That is Shamima biscuits, Piccadilly. And people like it. So even yesterday, I didn't come. Three days, I didn't come. And they were some of my customers, they are calling me that they don't get bread. So when they get the biscuits, they can use it for cocoa and for tea with the children. So they beg me I should come today so that they come and take the biscuits. That's why I'm here this morning. Okay, but are you part of those who are supposed to sell today? Yes. My shop is down and I have given my key so I can open and sell. Oh, but like me to I wanted to prepare food at home, but I realized I didn't have fish, so I decided to step out to buy some. Until I'm me buy fish, any meat, any we've been to know. Me wa shi si si anama sanko me nche kora. Even though there are just a few people in the market, how are traders taking it? Are they still making sales that they were a few weeks ago? We spoke to a few of them. Abe. Now, since I'm shut it down from this week, now Adrian, what is saying? Hmm. Purchase now, but from about from pa. Now, it is the last two weeks. The last. The number of people who come to the market have reduced drastically. Last week, I made 300 Ghana cities a day, but this week. I made 150 Ghana cities. Oh, 
in Crawford, I'm going to go to Mobano, a cross ban. I'm also a Mutsumupa, nay, eight hundred. I'm going to buy a two hundred. But say, say, no, a mama, price number four, a hundred in TNC at a sofa, a dear buffer. Emma Jelly, we turn to us. Oshay, a dream last week, and I hear a week's echo. Any and now, Obeka say, a dream net is saying. This year, a dream on a year. This year, a young man, so yeah, I'm wanted to swam my. And so yeah, a ton, yes, and yeah, a foot. Or more modifico may buy a sea of one, and then a young for me, so much me to see a year crying a high. So it's good to moon, yeah, by name. Ye be, yeah, yeah, I'm off of a tad and it's long one. I think market has generally been good. People still pass by to buy food stuff. Most of them say last week they didn't have money to stock up, but today they are able to. So far, it has been good. From the Kanishi market, we took a tour through town and ended up at the tiptoe lane. The tiptoe lane was unusually quiet with many police and military officers dotted across the entire stretch inspecting incoming vehicles. They were inspecting one thing, whether or not the drivers had sanitizers on them. Largely, Ghanaians are obeying the guidelines to hashtag stay at home. Some of you have been sending in your messages, your videos, keep them coming. I want to see, uh, just show us you talking to those people who are working very hard to keep all of us safe. So today, we'll take you to the front line and we're bringing you an appeal by the health workers urging you to stay at home and stop the spread of coronavirus. We'll also bring you a passionate appeal by one of our frontline workers, a military officer, uh, when he took time to advise one of the many trotters plying the streets of Accra. In the studio, I'll have another frontline worker, a doctor from the Kolibu Polyclinic. You can call in with your messages of encouragement, but also your questions those are crucial your questions so we can get some answers from the experts let's start uh, uh, off with the appeal by the doctors asking you to stay at home <laughs> COVID-19 caused by the coronavirus is a potentially deadly disease that has killed thousands of people worldwide. Unfortunately, it's here with us in Ghana. But do not panic, we can beat this. The disease moves when you move and it stops when you stop. Please stay at home unless it is an emergency. COVID-19 all right, so those are some of the uh, doctors that are urging you to stay at home. I'm here in the studio, Dr. Gordon Amor is one of our frontline workers, specialist family uh, physician from the Department of Family Medicine Polyclinic, uh, Kolibu Teaching Hospital, the Kolibu Polyclinic. He's in the studio today, so we can together celebrate people like him and ask questions on your mind. So do bring us some of your messages now, share it with him. Dr. Amor, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. For so, right. So first of all, um, I just want to get it clear. When we say frontline workers, a lot of people seem to have 
uh, uh, a bit of a misconception. Maybe we're getting it wrong, but maybe we can operationalize it as well. Yeah. Who, who are your typical frontline workers in cases like this? All right. Thank you once again, and um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so usually for the health sector, when we talk about frontline health workers, um, we are referring to the backbone of a health system. And uh, these are individuals who provide direct services that go a long way in helping in managing our patients. Okay. So we are looking at people like doctors, we are looking at nurses, pharmacists, and um, these are people who are critical staff okay. and they help in the uh, performance of uh, the health system. Okay. So these are those yeah. are the, yes, the, the frontline workers. In your experience, and from what we're seeing right now, there's a lockdown. Yeah. We're having security personnel go out there. Yeah. I've seen some of them wearing masks, some of yeah. them wearing gloves, some of them not wearing at all. Yeah. Would you put them in that space of, as frontline workers? Yes, because um, these are people who are all, I mean, fighting together. We are fighting a common enemy, that right. is COVID-19. Uh, so the security people, the, um, anybody who is playing a role, okay. critical role, to ensure that we are able to you know, achieve our ultimate goal yeah. uh, can be classified as a frontline, frontline worker. Yeah. But when okay. we talk specifically about the health sector, yeah. then we are looking at this cadre of health professionals that I mentioned okay. earlier. Okay, so but I'm then, not wrong. Okay, please go ahead. The other thing too is that um, usually there is a, a misconception that uh, frontline health workers especially in the context of COVID-19, maybe you're looking at people who are just managing confirmed cases. Okay. But well, any individual, any individual in the health system yeah. who is playing a particular role mm. in identifying, you know, even these patients is yeah. a frontline worker. So okay. if I take, for example, my facility, my facility is not a treatment center, mm -hmm. but we see cases who are suspected cases yeah. and then we they call the tax force, they take the sample and all of that. So, so you all have seen these cases. Yeah, I have. I then have. I should, then I should have done Sky with you. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I'm going to take a very quick break and when I come back I want you to give us a call. Okay? The number is zero three zero two two one one six nine one. That's zero three zero two two one one six nine one or zero three zero two two one one six nine two. We'll put the number on the screen. I'll take a very short break. I'll be right back. Do stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Why don't you give us a call now on 0302 211 or 0302 211 We're putting that number on your screen. If you know our WhatsApp number, you can also drop us a WhatsApp message and I'll ask the, uh, the doctor right here in the studio uh, for you. Dr. Moso, we're, we're back. We're, we're talking earlier about you know, casting the the, the net wide. Yeah. I, I Yesterday, we, we played on this front line um, our HR manager who, for him, he says, you know, cleaners are all involved. People, and, and I was just saying today, people who sell, who are still selling uh, food in, because they come in contact with people, they are exchanging money, all of that. Will you put all of them in that bracket or will it be far-fetched? Well, um, it depends on um, what your target is. Okay. And, and, but um, for me as a health worker, um, I appreciate the role of everybody, the security people, those who are providing food and all of that. But if you are asking me about uh, frontline health workers in mm. the context of the health system, then I will limit it to uh, okay. doctors, nurses and the other cadre of health professionals who okay. are playing that critical role. Okay. Yeah. I'm waiting to and get some, um, some of those calls. but. Yeah. Let me just t take you through some of the messages that I have. This yeah. one says, it's not easy these days to have your, do not call this number, please. It's not easy these days to have your partner as a health professional working tirelessly to save lives in this era of um, COVID-19. Putting their lives in danger to save lives is something that we're always proud of. And as a family and friends, family and friends of these frontline workers, we still love you and say thank you. How, how, how are your daily experiences with family and friends like? Has anything changed since COVID-19? Well, th things have changed because um, we are supposed to ensure social distancing and um, 
this is we are on in unprecedented times. Mm. Um, personally, there are times when I come home, my kids want to come to me. I tell them, no, don't come to me. I want to go and have my shower first. And there was this time when um, I came into contact with a suspected case and I uh, had to be isolated and I uh, had to call my wife and uh, it was a bit uncomfortable, you know. How did she feel? I mean, what, what was the first thing she said? Well, um, she's also a health worker, okay. so she understands, understands the risk involved in the job that we do. But um, naturally, you will be a bit concerned, but I was calm. And uh, hopefully, I mean, when the results came, it came as negative, and that was a sign of relief for me. Okay. Uh, so we experience these things on a daily basis, and um, we are in a, a time when, whenever you go to work, you, you can't really tell which patients yeah. you will come into contact with. And especially for me as a family physician and a primary care provider, uh, we see undifferentiated cases. That is, cases who come and it's like you will need to sort of um, find out whether they fit exactly the case definition. Them, okay, exactly. I just need to interrupt so, you briefly because I've had Ibrahim staying up or on the line, staying on the line for some time now. Ibrahim is calling from Tema, one of the places we're told is uh, uh, also was affected. Ibrahim. Ibrahim, talk to us. We're listening. Hello, good evening. Right. Please go ahead. Hello, good evening. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I just want to use this opportunity to uh, thank our frontline um, health workers for the, um, the great work that they are actually doing. In fact, um, we have actually appreciated their work. And I just want to encourage them that they should take care of themselves because in fact their lives are very, very important to us. Mm, that's true. Um, as a counter, I remember we were we debating the teacher and then the health worker who is more important. So <laughs> the I'm teacher not trying and the to health worker. The two, who but is more indeed, important? <laughs> we are seeing the importance of our health care. So we just want them to take proper care. We've been getting information from other jurisdictions that we are losing our health workers. Yes, it is, it is something that we are actually worried. So we're praying that God should strengthen them to be able to execute their mandate very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for calling. And I'm sure that uh, you are touched by that message. Uh, right. Is it encouraging? Yeah. All right. He says it is encouraging. And I'm hopeful that other doctors are seeing and feeling the same. Efia Techua is calling us from Kumasi. Efia. Hello. Yes, if you are on air. Yes, I just want to say a very big thank you to all the frontliners. Um, personally, I am the wife of a doctor. Doctor, my friend has the time. And seeing him leave the house every day is like, what is he coming to the house, bringing to the house? Hmm. And we really, this is a time we really need to pray for them. They really need our prayers. Very so you guys could do the whole money to bless you. Okay. And passing through these things and every day I have to pray because see my husband goes to work and it's like every day, my husband, are you okay? Are you safe? Because you don't know the person he is meeting. Exactly. So, so when, so when okay, your so husband goes home, you goes to work, you you're tempted to call her, uh, call him many more times to find out yeah. how he's doing than you used to. Yes, and when he comes, it's like I am afraid to even hug him. Oh. But you and have to maintain social distancing. I don't even to have sex with him. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I uh, pretend he didn't say that. But anyway. <laughs> But I mean, I, I mean, that's a curious discussion that we can have later. I don't know yes. whether it's safe or not safe to um, to engage your partner sexually when they are frontline workers. But I believe it's fine. Doesn't your husband say so? Okay, he <laughs> looks like I've lost it yet. So I'm just going to throw that question to you before I pick um, Alhaji, who's calling from Savalugu. Is it really scary? to have sexual relations with your partner because you are meeting sick people? Um, in the context of COVID-19, yeah. um, currently there is no evidence to show that um, it's transmitted to, I mean, having sexual intercourse. No, but of course, when you, 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 when you, if you're kissing, that's that well, because we're told yes. that it's in the mouth, right? Yes, yes. So, I mean, with that, there's a possibility. Okay, so what do you do then? Uh, um, um, okay, I don't, I'm not quite sure. Okay, so then what do you do? Um, is it safer to have sex without kissing? 
Well, <laughs> this okay. is a difficult one to answer. <laughs> this is a difficult one to answer. Okay. And um, especially when uh, we also know that there are uh, people who have the disease, but they no are not symptoms. showing symptoms. That's okay. asymptomatic uh, okay. people, patients. Right. So, but then um, I think that is a decision that um, every couple will have to decide for themselves. Um, it will be difficult to give um, a definite answer that couples should avoid um, sexual intercourse, I mean, during this time, that would be very difficult. But I think that if you are married to a health worker, that is something that um, both of you have to decide on what to do. But I personally okay. know, I personally know uh, some health workers who, because of the level of risk that they are exposed to, have decided that they are not going to stay at home for a while. Okay. So that is, that is something that okay. people can also consider. That's a conversation we can have uh, further, I believe. I have two more calls to take. Alhaji, Alhaji, I can't really mention your name. Bini Yuri Bushani is calling from Savalugu. Alhaji, let's hear you. Yeah, uh, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, thanks to have me this evening. Uh, first of all, let me send my respect to doctor and you. Uh, we really appreciate what you done for us. Yes, please can go I, ahead. We hear you. Can, can you hear me? I do hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I just want to greet you very okay. well. All right. For the indication you give it to us for the Joy TV, I'm really watch the, your program always. Thank you. So, so I just want to greet you. Thank you very much. Well, you. Keep watching and keep encouraging people close to you to observe you. social distancing, to stay far away from each other as possible, and tell people to stay at home if they have nothing doing um, in mm. town. Okay, by okay. our side, uh, mm. I think Tamale uh, Mia has criticized people for Tamale. Everybody see what is happening for Tamale. And because they don't announce if you're riding motor with your uh, sister or your brother and they should stop you and beat you. Is uh, that what's because, happening in Tamale? Yeah, is that what's happening in Tamale? Okay, we'll, 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 people, we'll send our reporters to take a look on the street. Uh, yeah, if you, but I think your, your reporter, Martina Bugure, right. is the reporter for you. We'll yeah, put her okay, on that. Thank we'll you, thank you, thank thank you, you so yeah. much. Yeboah from Cape Coast is my final caller. Yeboah, you're on air. Uh, good evening. Yes, good evening, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this this morning, uh, yeah, this morning, I heard the minister for uh, information minister for health minister. or information. Uh, a response uh, to a question that was asked uh, uh, about the next, the frontline workers. Okay. And uh, they refused to deny it. But her sister also confirmed that she had to walk. Mm -hmm. She left home around uh, 2. She stood there for about 45 minutes. There was no vehicle come. So she had to walk. From a place to Kolebu. Uh, so nurses are walking the, to nurses are walking to work. To uh, Kolebu from a house. It's okay. a distance because there was no car, there was no vehicle. Okay. She stood there for over forty-five minutes. And she so I don't know, but I, the, the what I remember the minister say was a, was about was more about PPEs. I think what I heard him say was more about PPEs. He said that if you are in a health facility that doesn't have PPEs, there is a number you can call. I think that was one uh, one 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 three, uh, three one one. Sorry, it was three one one for you to call so that they'll follow up. Uh, uh, they'll make the necessary follow-ups. But thank you very much, Yabwa, for calling. I said Yabwa was my final caller, but I think I do have um, Noah from the Volta Region. We'll make that a final caller. Noah, you're on air. Yeah, good evening. Right, please go. Please, ahead. I want to I want to thank Dr. Amwa very well for his presentation. God really bless him. He keep on doing that. And secondly, to our honourable uh, Minister of Health, he made mention of DRP treatment. Please, I want to plead with them. When they want to establish, uh, when they establish that, uh, to uh, to worry those of us who are nowhere to do. You see, they'll focus on those DRP people and we, the poor ones, will be left behind. 
Mm. But they didn't forget, all of us were in Ghana here, and they were struggling that Ghana is not good for them. So they imported a sickness into Ghana. So they shouldn't turn and look at them and leave with the poor ones behind. Okay, so, so just, to, it, just to be clear, what he said, just, hold on, Noah. What, just to be clear, what he said was that the Bank of Ghana has given them uh, a part of their facility to use to manage the case. But what is happening is going to happen is that the Bank of Ghana has said that that place will be used for people, uh, the bankers or people who work within the Bank of Ghana and VIPs. That's what he said. But, but go ahead and make your point. Wrap it up. Okay, well noted. That is what I was. I was okay. a bit worried. All right, yeah. but so he also, also talked about the. He for... also talked about the available health centers that can manage this situation. As yeah. we pray that we won't get to the place where other countries have gotten to and are really suffering. Uh, okay. Yeah? Noah, thank you for calling. Noah is calling from the Volta region. So, a lot of people have a lot of love for uh, our frontline workers, but we do appreciate that there are challenges. Everybody else has. Um, their challenges and we've seen what's happening in Italy I mean every now and then people will come out on the windows to you know clap for them and all that I wonder how your colleagues and yourself feel about it does it make the work any easier well in terms of um, challenges um, yes I mean there are ch obvious challenges and um, I know there are facilities who are still grappling with um, shortage of PPEs or unavailability of PPEs, um, especially those at the peripheries, and um, that is something that is of concern to uh, most uh, clinicians because um, the PPEs are the ones that are supposed to the <coughs> supposed to protect you. Protect you, yeah. Right. And um, without the PPEs, um, it makes it a bit difficult uh, to really uh, do what you want to do. Um, I think another challenge had to do with the turnaround time in terms of getting the lab results. Mm. Um, initially, we were made aware that it takes a minimum of about six hours mm -hmm. for the results to, to come in. And therefore, you are expecting that within 24 hours, you should have the results. But um, for some cases, you get the results maybe 48 hours afterwards, mm -hmm. and it makes it a bit difficult, difficult. because there are some cases that um, you have a challenge in being able to confidently say that this is COVID-19 or this another condition. Yeah, yeah. Because before COVID-19, we're seeing cases, pneumonia and other conditions that can present or upper respiratory tract infection that can present just like COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now that we have COVID-19, uh, it's, it's assumed that anybody who presents these symptoms, you need to have a high index of suspicion. Mm. And therefore, the lab, getting the lab results is very critical sure. in being able to separate COVID-19 from other conditions. So if the lab delays, then it becomes a bit difficult. Yeah, and, but in the meantime, uh, you still have to take all those precautions Yes, and, and assume that this is a positive uh, COVID-19 case, well, just so you can protect yourself. Th that is true, but then, you know, if this is a confirmed case, the PPEs that you wear is different. Uh -huh. from when you have a suspected case coming to your facility. Okay. So that is a bit of a challenge. So you, most of the time you need the labs to come in very quickly. Mm. So I was happy when I heard um, the Minister of Health uh, saying that uh, Kulibu is going to be made, going to have the reference lab being made a center, a testing okay. center. And that is, that is really good news. That's so a good thing? Okay. If we can have more testing centers, that would, that would, that would really help. More testing centers, you'd say. We're going to have to uh, wrap up. But just a quick question that came in. It says, I would like to thank everyone um, who is helping during this time. I want to know what we do about the clothing, our clothing. We, we wash our hands, we sanitize it. But uh, he says, if I'm well informed, the virus can be in clothing too for some time. Yeah. What, what, what can we say, uh, say to people who are thinking about this? So, so for, for those of us in the health sector, um, we know that chlorine, mm -hmm. chlorine solution, the virus uh, is able to kill the virus. So okay. um, even for my department, uh, there's been a discussion that people should wear scraps instead of wearing okay. scraps. That's what yeah. usually yeah. you see yeah. uh, those outside. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Canada, that's what most of them yeah. wear. So if you wear the scraps, then you can actually change before going home so that mm. you don't wear your clothing home. So that's a discussion that um, you are still others, having. Can, can, can okay. have and decide on the best way forward. Okay, well, um, we're going to uh, wrap up uh, here. 
we still have other things that we can we need to bring to you but most of you are bringing in your messages your videos thank you so much i will try and read this poem <laughs> uh let's see he says your passion for this job makes me high and vicious anytime i taste the underground mucus oh frontliners you are my hibiscus stay safe frontliners ghana don't want to lose you nanaba from university of energy and natural resources thank you for sending in those messages let me take your final words and hopefully we'll have you more uh, on this segment and we'll talk more yes yeah, so um I want to tell every Ghanaian who is watching us right now that um, there have been certain directives that we are all supposed to comply with. I will plead with everybody to try and adhere to these directives as much as possible. If you don't have any business going to town, stay at home. Mm. Um, there's a common saying that is, um, I think the Minister of Education even mentioned that the virus moves mm. when individuals also move. move. So as much as possible, people should stay at home. And then the washing of the hands with soap and water is very essential. Mm. Use of sanitizers is also essential. And then social distancing. And I believe that if we do this coupled by the prayers of all Ghanaians, we'll be able to sail through. Hopefully we'll be able to sail through. I've been talking to Dr. Amo. Uh, Gordon Amo is a specialist uh, family physician from the Department of Family Medicine, uh, the Kolibu Polyclinic. Uh, this is Frontline. It's a segment we've created here on The Pulse to just celebrate people who are going the extra mile to help all of us stay strong, to help all of us stay safe from COVID-19 as we also commit to staying at home. Well, it takes a lot of courage to confront uh, uh, your enemy. So take a look at this soldier who got uh, you know, very passionate about COVID-19 when he was checking the vehicles on our streets. But it's better than losing your lives. Do you understand? It is better than losing your lives. Go through the hardships in your house. It is better than you live in this world. Your maker up there has a purpose for you. So please stay home. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Make it very easy for everybody. Just we, have, we all have our families. We have been happy staying with our families back home, but we are out here working for God and country, and then for you. So please stay home. Don't make it difficult for us. Stay home for us. We all have families too. They say he said, but we are all here working. This is Frontline here on the Pulse. and administration of the Ghana Tourism Authority says patrons of be is urging patrons of beaches to continue to adhere to President Okufado's directive to stay at home and also respect the, uh, the GTA's closure of all beaches in the country. Speaking to the media after touring some of them in a car, he stated that the directive is important as a way of reducing the spread of coronavirus. Uh, we still can do better. We still can do better. There are some places where the social distance was also being complied with. But then, you still have some recalcitrant ones who would want to do as they wish. And it is our plea that we comply with the president's directive. It is better for all of us to stay alive, go by the protocols, so that at least we can minimize the spread of this pandemic. In as much as we would want to uh, enforce compliance, looking at the numbers, we also have to be very tactful about it. Notices were placed, and like I said earlier on, there is some element of compliance. Yes, we cannot deny that. Even though compliance is not total, it's not absolute, the numbers have gone down to some extent, and we can only plead and educate them and persuade their morals that they should fully and completely abide by the president's directives. The emergency national disinfection exercise currently underway in the northeast 
was delayed at Langbinsi. Residents, according to a reporter, were not complying with the directives. Shops and stores in the market area were all opened, forcing the disinfection team to host the process. My colleague Eliasu Tanko joins me on Skype with more. Eliasu, uh, tell us uh, more about this disinfection exercise. Has it ended already? Yes, it has ended across the six districts in the northeast region. It started this morning uh, at Nalirgu, the regional capital. Uh, in that particular uh, area, about 30 uh, markets uh, were today disinfected by the Zoom Lion team. And also in the West Mampusi municipality, there about 20 markets were also, uh, I mean, uh, disinfected. So in all, we had about 120 uh, medium and small markets that uh, were disinfected today. And you say that the the market, the people who work within the market, made made uh, the process pretty difficult uh, for the officials. Uh, yes, and that was uh, uh, one we visited. It was actually very smooth uh, in uh, the regional capital. When we visited the market, everybody had shut their stores, and uh, only a handful of people were standing around. Uh, I guess they did not understand what was going to go on. Uh, this is the first time of seeing such incidents. So a couple of people were gathered around uh, the market, and they were observing. Uh, but when the minister himself came with the security officers, it was very easy for him to advise them to get inside their house because of uh, the chemicals. Uh, but when we go to Kambaga, uh, that was when the, we observed that even the social uh, distancing protocols were not, I mean, uh, fully adhered to. There were lots of people sitting by the roadside, uh, clearly more than 25 people will be seen gathered around. Uh, and, 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 and when we got to the marketplace, uh, because of that incident, the, the, the authorities had to, I mean, put roadblocks in the market to stay to make the people stay away for the exercise to go on. And when we got to Langdon Sea Market, actually that was where uh, everybody, including the minister himself, was first surprised. Uh, because the market was active, people came there, they opened their stores as if nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. And so when he, the minister and his team got there, he had to uh, ask the security uh, to go and make the people shut their stores um, uh, before this exercise began. I spoke right. to some of the people who were in the market, and they told me that they actually did not understand the message that was given to them. So perhaps some more education and communication down there. Eliasu, thank you for that update. Eliasu Tanko, the uh, Northeast correspondent. Let's go to the Upper East region where Albert Sori is uh, joining us from. Albert, what, how did the exercise go in, in your region? Yes, yes, so in the Upper East region, the exercise was very smooth. Um, the, the advantage with um, the Upper East region is that for most of the places where we have markets, we also have market days, um, which come every three days uh, within the week. Okay. So for those markets where the market day did not fall uh, today, um, you know, usually you don't have many people on a non-market day. So it made it very easy for um, people to stay away. So we did, um, in total, we are told that 105 markets will be covered. But our team was divided into two. Um, one of the teams went to the eastern part, the other went to the western part. So in, in the uh, western part where I, uh, we covered the um, Bolgatanga Central Market, we covered the Navungo Market, we also went to uh, Paga which is the border town as well. And the exercise was generally smooth. Now, announcements were uh, already made, you know, to the effect that the disinfection exercise was going to come off today. So by 5 a.m., um, when the team gathered uh, to prepare for the exercise, uh, it, it made it easy for uh, people to see and not even show up at all, mainly because of the fact that they started early. So, um, generally, it was uh, very smooth. We got to Navrongo with the municipal chief executive, and he briefed us as well on the fact that um, they needed to 
get the announcements going for the past three days uh, to ensure that people don't come to the market today because of this disinfection exercise. And so um, everybody cooperated and the exercise was smooth. At Paga, when we got there, you know, um, at this time of the, uh, the upper east region, the sun is always uh, very hot. It's part of the reason they had to start very early. So by the time we uh, got to uh, Paga, which is the border town, the exercise had already been carried out. Okay. But then we also got to speak to the uh, district chief executive for the area um, okay. on some of the things put in place um, in Paga because it is a border town. Oh, right. He talked about the fact... Well, Albert, sorry. Uh, we've lost Albert, sorry there. Albert, sorry, joined us from the Upper East region. Let's go to the Upper West region where a similar exercise went on. Rafiq Salam monitored it. He joins me on the line. Rafiq Salam. Hello, Gifi. Tell us uh, your, your, for what happened as far as the disinfection exercise in the Upper uh, West region. In the Upper West region, before 6 a.m., the people who were supposed to do the mass screen exercise had converged at the forecourt of the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council. So in Upper West Region, uh, the sprayers uh, are numbering up to about 388, and they are going to disinfect 110 markets, and which they did with dexterity and aplomb, starting with the Wa market and also the Wa Laura Park. And that was where the Upper West Regional Minister, uh, uh, who was accompanied by the municipal chief executive for what allowed you to uh, they went around to ensure that the exercise at that particular market was what was done and done well. There are other uh, six uh, markets in the one municipality uh, that were also uh, spring. And then from there, the team moved to Nadoli uh, and then also to Jirapa. You know, these areas are CSM belts. You know, these are areas that when CSM uh, anytime um, a disease disease, uh, people from these areas are mostly affected. And so the exercise at that particular place was done earlier. And so by the time we got to uh, Nadoli and also Jirapa, the exercise had already been, been done. But speaking to the municipal chief executive for Jirapa and also uh, talking about the Nadoli district chief executive, Nankuno, uh, they spoke about one thing, about banning Mac weekly market at Jirapa and also at Nadoli. And so for Nadoli, they have placed a ban, two weeks ban, on the weekly market at Nadoli. You can only go to the daily market. But also at Jirapa, they are saying that it's indefinite and until the, the cases in the country are reduced, they are not going to lift that indefinite ban. And then also we move to Babali, one of the biggest markets uh, in the northern belt of the country, uh, where uh, we went and then uh, we met the municipal chief executive for Laura. Uh, and Martin Domestira, and he also spoke about uh, some uh, of the measures that they have put in place uh, to at least uh, to not let the people infect uh, with this coronavirus. But their greatest challenge has to do with the influx of people from uh, the Black Vault into the Laura municipality. You know, there's a border between Laura and then also Burkina Faso around the deeper area. And so there are also unapproved routes, and then people, as we said yesterday, right. eight people, eight Burkina Faso were arrested. Uh, in that particular area, and so they were sent back mm. to Burkina Faso. Rafiq, thank you very much for those updates. Rafiq, salam there uh, with those updates. So this infection exercises have been going on in the market. It's, it happened here in Accra. It's happened in the Ashanti region. It's happening in the Upper West, Upper East, uh, and the Northeast region as well. This is where we call it a wrap, by the way. There is more news if you log on to myjoyonline.com. And our carefully selected stories for you. Scroll all the way down for our YouTube link. And uh, I leave you with uh, one of those songs. A lot of songs have been made for coronavirus. My name is Gifty Andopia. Take a look as we wrap up.